Hello everyone and welcome to the virtual edition of our private pilot ground school. So it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, we haven't done this, at least with the private pilot ground school before. So with everything that's going on and everyone's busy schedules as well, we decided to do things a little bit differently. So this will be the first in a series of videos. We're going to have videos for each of the chapters in your book and every week we will approximately cover three chapters and what we're gonna do is I expect you guys to read the book and then watch the video where I'm gonna highlight some of the more important items from the chapter at least those that I consider to be the most important and from there that will lead us to our discussions every week so every week we will discuss those three chapters so it's gonna be a six-week journey here together and I Hope that you guys enjoy it and definitely give me your feedback. So becoming a pilot, what's what's involved? Now there are different pilot certificates out there that you can get. There's this newer sport pilot certificate. What's involved with that? Well, it's a minimum of 20 hours of flight time. And you're talking about one or two seat aircraft. You can only fly during the day. You can't fly above 10,000 feet and you're restricted to a maximum speed of 138 miles per hour and a maximum weight of 1,320 pounds. Most people will want to get a private pilot certificate. Now a private pilot certificate in a sense rolls down to a sport pilot certificate. What do I mean by that? If you have a private pilot certificate and you want to fly an aircraft that you could fly with a sport pilot certificate, you can still fly it with your private pilot certificate. Just like I can fly anything with my commercial pilot certificate that a private pilot could fly. So the private pilot is a minimum of 40 hours of flight time. Now, something you should be aware of, the national average time is about 73 hours. The biggest reason for that is that people will stretch out their flight training. It's not unusual for someone to take a year, year and a half to get their license. And that can be a couple of things. It can be just work. You know, they're really busy. They don't have time to fly very frequently. It could be that the, they don't have the money to do it all at once. And it could be something else. So because people tend to stretch out their training, the national average is much higher than 40. I will say this, uh, normally when I have students come to me, I recommend that they fly, if they can do it, two to three times a week. Because you should figure that on average, about one third of all your lessons will get canceled, most likely because of weather. When you're just learning, you need some really good weather. As you progress, you can fly in weather that's less and less ideal. You know, even things that you might not normally think about, you might think, oh, it's a nice sunny day. Well, it's also super breezy. When you're starting out as a pilot, that can be too much of a challenge. As you start to progress, you actually want to fly when it's breezy because you want to get that experience. In fact, just today, I was flying with a student and I was glad it was a little bit breezy and it had never been that breezy when he had been flying. So at the end of the lesson, we were both happy we were able to fly today. Uh, a private pilot, you're not restricted. There's no limit to the number of passengers. It's like whatever your plane can hold, you're good. Uh, you have to stay below 18,000 feet until you get an instrument rating. Uh, honestly, though, many of these smaller aircraft can't get up to 18,000 feet anyway because they don't have turbochargers and things like that. So the air gets too thin for them but you're restricted to 18,000 feet until you're rated, you're instrument rated. 
There's no maximum speed restriction. Some of these planes will go 200 miles an hour or more. And the maximum weight that you can handle is 12,500 pounds. So it's a much larger aircraft that you can legally fly as a private pilot. So if you look at your flight lessons, there are different phases or stages for your flight training. You start out in this basic pre-solo stage. So here you're learning all the basic stuff, right? How do I turn, climb, descend? How do we do stalls? And you're like, what's a stall? That's when you try to climb too quickly. Basically you get the nose too far up in the air and the wings say, hey, you went too far and I'm not gonna produce any more lift. And that's something that your flight instructor will talk to you about a lot. And you need to be able to do certain basic things. Obviously you have to be able to take off and land by yourself. Once you've completed all the things on the FAA's list and you've convinced your instructor that you are safe to take off and land by yourself, and you've gone to that special aviation doctor and gotten a medical certificate, and you have a student pilot certificate in your hand, then you can do your first solo. So typically first solo is three times around the traffic pattern by yourself. When that's over, the tradition is that we cut the back of your shirt off and then we write on it and we hang it up at the airport. So if you go to the airport, you'll notice that there are several framed shirt backs from some of our recent pilots. Once you get past that solo, then your training really takes off, dare I say. And now you're into this cross country phase where you start to take trips first with your instructor, then you'll take trips by yourself. You have to do five hours of trips by yourself. So of the 40, five, 40 hours required, 20 of them have to be with an instructor, 10 of them have to be by yourself, and five of those 10 hours by yourself are taking trips. There's a couple of other things that you have to do, like a little bit of instrument training, some nighttime training, and that's also in this phase. Once you've accomplished everything that's on the FAA list, you've done all of your trips by yourself, you've done your night training, you've done your instrument training, you've done everything, you checked every box, then you get to the last stage, which is labeled check ride preparation here. It's basically the polishing stage where I'm going to fly with you and I'm gonna say, okay, your standards are being met. Your landings meet the standards. All your maneuvers meet the standards. Let's get you hooked up with an examiner. So we'll schedule your check ride, which again is gonna be that oral exam followed by the flight. If you complete that to the standards, at the end of it, you will get a temporary pilot certificate. And now you're a private pilot. You can exercise all the privileges that come with that. Okay, well, let's talk about the scary stuff. Costs. Obviously, if it was free, a lot of people would fly. Everyone would fly if it was free, practically. So what does it cost? Well, you know, one thing I think you'll find it doesn't cost as much as you might think. And it is very comparable to a couple of other things like a Disney vacation for your family, a used jet ski or snowmobile. If you prefer season tickets, a used ATV or installing an outdoor patio. These are all similar cost items to learning how to fly. So when you learn to fly and you get your pilot's license, this is something you have for life. Right? Your pilot's license doesn't ever expire. Every two years, every pilot, including flight instructors, have to spend a little bit of time with a flight instructor doing a review. You can go years without flying and then 
go to the doctor, get a medical certificate, and then go and see a flight instructor, spend a couple hours with them, and you're good to go again. This is something I did myself. I took about six or seven years off while I was building my airplane, and I didn't fly. So when I was getting close to the end of that process, I decided to start flying again, and I went and spent a couple hours with an instructor, went back to the doctor, and boom, I was able to fly again just like I had never stopped. So that's something to keep in mind. This is a life skill. This is something you can do for the rest of your life, pretty much. Okay. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can train, but I wanted to give you some example costs for the local flying club. Now, the local flying club is the Parlor City Flying Club, also known as the Bloomsburg Flying Club. Now, they have a couple of aircraft that they use, and their training aircraft is a Cessna 172A, which they currently rent to their members for $95 an hour. Now, a little bit about plane rental. In general, if you schedule a lesson, it's typically a two-hour block, but you're not going to fly two hours. You're going to fly about an hour to an hour and a half, and for the earlier lessons, you're probably going to fly closer to the hour. Because what you're going to find is as you fly, when you're just starting out, if you fly too long, you start to get tired and your performance goes way down. So your instructor will be like, I think we're good for today. Sometimes I get people that say, hey, Phil, I want to fly for like, you know, three hours at a chunk. And it's like, no, you don't. Right. That is not going to work for you. So the aircraft, um, you know, I've used kind of some typical numbers. I said 55 hours, not the minimum 40. I think 55 hours is a pretty reasonable number if you're training frequently and by frequently, I mean two to three times a week. Uh, 55 hours would be pretty typical. You know, you might come in a little bit lower than that. And hey, it's better to estimate high and then spend less and be happy. Right. Now, of course, most people don't spend less. They just spend the money they saved on something else. But that's another story. So if you do that, uh, the club, you pay 350 to join the club. And then the dues are $45 a month. So, you know, you're looking at $350 to join. And then you have flight instruction time. So of those 55 hours, 30 hours or so is pretty typical that you would spend with an instructor. You're not going to spend the whole time with an instructor. In fact, you can't. Remember, you need it at least 10 hours by yourself. So 30 hours with an instructor, if you figure the instructor's about $50 an hour, there's another $1,500. And then about $500 for miscellaneous supplies. You know, you might want to buy a headset, maybe a book for the ground school, things like that. And you're looking at a total of investment of about $7,500. Which again, is not that bad for a lifetime skill. Of course, all the standard caveats apply. This is typical numbers. Your mileage may vary. You know, it depends on things like natural ability that you might have for flying and also things like are you training regularly or not. Hey guys, I thought that one of the best ways to kind of walk you through chapter one, which is about basic stuff such as how do I identify different parts of an airplane and things like that was to walk you through the pre-flight of a couple of airplanes. So we're going to walk you through the pre-flight of a very basic airplane, a Cessna 172A, which is a training aircraft in the flying club here in Bloomsburg. And we're also going to walk you through the pre-flight of a much more advanced aircraft, which is a Piper Lance. It's a six passenger aircraft it's high performance and has retractable gear and all of that so hopefully you'll enjoy this introduction i realize it doesn't strictly follow chapter one in the book 
but I think that this will be beneficial. All right, guys, so this is Catherine, and she's going to walk us through a pre flight of a Cessna 172A, which is uh, this is our flying club here in Bloomsburg's training aircraft. As you can see, it's basic aviation. All right, so Catherine, of course, has her checklist, and it starts with what? Uh, checking for the aero documents, which are generally located somewhere. So that's airworthiness, registration, those are those two pieces of paper, operating limitations, and weight and balance, which can be found in this case inside the glove box in the your 1960 Cessna 172 manual in the back we have weight and balance information for this airplane all right so what's next next we have to put the flaps down all right so we have the flaps down and now we're ready to go outside yep so first we're going to check the leading edge all right and what are these things here in the leading edge it's this Stall warning. Yep. We're going to check and make sure that moves. This There's one. the pitot tube that provides yep. the ram air pressure for the airspeed. And over here, by the way, this little hole is the static port. So it compares those two pressures. And what's this thing, Catherine? That, pretty sure, isn't that for the, the fuel? Fuel vent. Yeah. The fuel vent. So you have to make sure that's not clogged because if it's clogged it's bad and you can get a vacuum in there as the fuel goes out. Yeah. Alright, so you're checking the leading edge, making oh. sure there's new new no new dents. Not new? Nope. Okay, it's cool. not new. Alright, we already checked the pedo, we checked the fuel vent. Checking the wing tip. Yep. Making sure nothing's falling off of the wing tip. And now you're gonna check. This aileron. control surface, that's called an aileron. What does it do? It well, turns there. the plane. It turns the plane. All right, oh, so you want to check these hinges. So there's three oh. hinges here. And you want to make sure that the cotter pins are in those hinges. Always and they are? Hold up a hand. Before you put your hand in, right. Yeah. Okay. And now we're checking our flaps. Standard Cessna flap wiggle. Yep. And you're also checking to make sure the flaps are on these tracks and that this control rod here is nice and tight. Now we're going to sump the fuel. Now we're going to sump the fuel. So go ahead and push up, get a little bit of a fuel sample. That's enough. And it's blue. You can hold it up against something white if need be. Just to double check. And there's no crud in it. So that's good. While we're here, we're checking the tire. We're checking it for tread and inflation. And we're checking our brake pads. We got plenty of brake pads still. We're also checking the brake line, make sure that nothing's leaking, and it's not. And that brings us to the tail. So you're going to check the tail. What's the fancy word for the tail? The empennage. Empennage. So testing the empennage. Okay. And we're looking for smoking rivets. If the rivet starts to work in the hole, it will generate metal flakes that generally will go back toward the aft section and we don't see any of that. While we're here we're checking these antennas. So I see antennas here and here and Catherine knows what all of these antennas are for. Nope. <laughs> so this guy in the back is an ELT, emergency locator transmitter antenna. It's usually found in the back of the plane because the back of the plane will survive most crashes. And these guys up on top are both communications antennas 
and the V on the tail, which is actually pointing forward in this plane, is a VOR navigation antenna. Right. So now we're checking the tail, making sure that everything runs smoothly. So this part is called the horizontal stabilizer. And what's the part that moves? This is the trim tab. Wait, no, the elevator. Yeah, that would be a very large trim tab. That's yeah, the elevator. So we're checking the hinges here and here. And they look good. Checking the rudder. Pro tip, this little trim tab on the rudder, you shouldn't bend it. It's set that way for a reason. All right. This is the trim tab. So you want to check this hinge, make sure this hinge isn't coming apart on the ends, and it's not. Make sure the elevator moves. And now what? All right, same study, same thing as on the other side, and here we have an inspection plate for accessing the ELT. Make sure that that's good. Do the flap check. Yep. Looks good. We can go ahead and check our ailerons. Pretty good or airworthy? Airworthy. Okay. And the same thing, nothing's falling off in the wingtip. A lot less to check on the leading edge here. And now we're going to check this tire. Same thing, tread and inflation and brake pad. We have all that. And you're going to check the fuel. You're going to push up. All right, that's enough. And it looks nice and clear. All right. I should say clear blue, not just clear. And what are these things, Catherine? Those things. Are those Venturis? Yeah. For generating vacuum to run the gyros? Yep. Yep. Pretty much. All right, okay. so windscreen is clean. I need to check this All right, this one has another fuel sump down here. And this one's a little bit hard to check because you actually have to work something inside. But we'll come back to that one. All right. And Checking the nose, checking the propeller, leading edges. So you want to feel the leading edges. Make sure that there's no nicks in them. It's good there. Nobody made a home up in the cowling. The air cleaner, the air filter, I should say, looks okay. And the nose gear looks good. There's inflation in the strut. And the tire looks good as well. So we're almost done. Only thing that we have left to do is check the oil. So go ahead and open the engine cowl. And for this, we're going to need a paper towel. All right, so now we're gonna check the oil. This particular plane has a wet sump system and this dipstick locks in place. So we have to turn it, unlock it, pull it out, and we check this one has over five quarts of oil, which means it's fine. Put it back in, lock it in place. So all aircraft engines have to run on half their maximum oil capacity and this engine will take up to eight quarts so it has to actually operate with four 
Not necessarily well, but it has to operate with four. And we already checked our static port. So that is pretty much a pre-flight on a 172A. A uh, couple of quick things while we have the engine cowl open. This is a six cylinder engine. We can see the cylinders are here. There are two spark plugs per cylinder because there are two ignition systems. We'll talk about that during our ground school. And we have two magnetos for our ignition system. Here's the left one. And the other one is called the right one. It's very creative how they name those. Here's our battery. This is the solenoid for the battery. And we have our voltage regulator here. This particular engine actually has a generator on the back and a couple of other things on the back. So there you have it. That's how you can pre-flight a 172. All right, guys. So I wanted to show you real quickly a pre-flight of a little bit more sophisticated aircraft. So this is a Piper Lance, which is a retractable aircraft. So same thing, just like always, we are going to have a checklist and I'm going to make sure that things are set. Like here, this has retractable gear, so I'm making sure that the gear is down and flight controls are moving and my trim is properly set. My airworthiness certificate is in the pocket behind me and I know it's there. My registration is already there as well. And you know, I can look for things like random things that fall out. Uh, I can look for things like my operating handbook, which is in the aircraft as well. Now, if I turn on the power of this aircraft, you'll see a couple of things like the gear lights will come on and that tells me that the gear is down and that's good especially since I'm on the ground right now it would be really bad if it wasn't and I can check my fuel gauges and see if I have fuel looks like I'm down a little bit on the one side and I can check all of my warning lights they are functioning properly and I could also check my external lights if I wanted to so I'm going to go ahead and turn that off and head outside. Okay, so now we're checking our right wing. The step here is secure. I know it is because I just stepped on it and it worked. My flap is secure and of course my ailerons. Just like in the Cessna, I check and I check my hinges. That all looks good. Checking my wing tip. Leading edges, making sure there's not any weird dents that didn't used to be there. Check my fuel. I can actually visually check my fuel and I can see that this tank is a little bit down. This aircraft even has a fuel gauge, which is reading about 30 gallons on this side. This aircraft will hold 47 gallons. And now I want to check my tire. I'm checking for tread and inflation. And I'm also checking for brake pad right back here. This is a gear door, by the way. So when the landing gear goes up, you can see it goes into this little hole over here. And that gives it a little bit better aerodynamics. Okay. Check my fuel using the sump, which is right here. Looks nice and blue. I continue to the front. My windshield looks clear. This is a baggage compartment. I want to make sure that's closed, and it is. Checking my prop. This has a three-bladed prop. Running my fingers down the leading edges. The rule is if you can draw blood, you should definitely see a mechanic. I'm getting a tetanus shot. Making sure that nobody made a home up in the cowling. This little belt is the alternator belt. So if I want to have radios for long, I want to make sure that that is secured. This plane actually has air conditioning. So I could check this belt over here for the air conditioner. It's also good. 
I'm checking the spinner, make sure there's no cracks, especially around these screw holes, and there isn't. This is my landing light, it looks good. Checking my nose gear, the tire looks good, lots of tread, it's properly inflated, and this strut isn't collapsed. So this little scissor hinge here is open, and I have a good hand width of silver showing there. Okay. So coming over to this side, I'm going to check my oil. There's a little panel here. And I pull out my dipstick. This engine will hold 12 quarts of oil. And I can see that I have plenty of oil in there. So let me get my dipstick back in and locked. All right, checking. Everything is secure here. This is a ground power plug if my battery is dead and I want to start my engine. Checking my leading edges here. By the way, this here is an interesting feature. It's an extra pitot tube. It is part of an emergency gear extension system built into some of the pipers. So if you go too slow and you don't have your landing gear down, it'll throw it down for you. So you don't have those embarrassing accidents. All right, so I'm checking the gear here. This tire looks brand new, because it is. And I have proper inflation and lots of brake pad. Once again, I check the fuel, nice and blue. I can look at the gauge. Gage says this tank is full. And this is my stall warning. So I want to make sure that this moves freely. And then down here, I see this guy. This is my pitot tube for the piper. There's my hole in the front, that's my pitot. And there's a hole here and another hole in the back. And that's my static port. So it's a different system than what's in the Cessna. Just like the other aircraft, I can actually look and visually inspect my fuel and see how much fuel I have. And checking the wing tip. Everything looks good. Hinges look good and secure. Flat looks good. If I was going to go flying, obviously I'd want to close the rear passenger door. This is a six passenger aircraft. So it has club seating in the back. So your passengers in the back get to face each other. A couple of the seats have been taken out at the moment. All right, so continuing my inspection. Also looking at antennas. These are communication antennas. The V antenna on the tail, that's a VOR. This is an ELT antenna, emergency locator transmitter. And this tail is a little bit different. You'll notice, unlike the Cessna, the entire surface moves. So this is called a stabilator. It has a number of aerodynamic advantages over the stabilizer and elevator situation. And the other thing you'll notice is this whole tab here. That is the trim tab, but it also moves when I move the stabilator up and down because that helps to balance the control pressures. Then I have to check my rudder. These little things, by the way, are static wicks. So if static electricity builds up on the aircraft while you're flying through the clouds, it'll discharge these wicks. It prevents interference on your radios and such. Uh, checking my tail light. This one actually has a fancy tail light. It has an ADS-B transmitter and some other things in it. And I have the red rotating beacon up there as well. So then I continue my walk around looking for any new dents or other troubles, making sure that all these panels are nicely secure and I get back to where I started. So that is a quick 
pre-flight of a Piper Lance. All right, folks. Well, that wraps up our first video for chapter one, which was all about some basic info and, you know, what are the different parts of an airplane and hopefully you enjoyed our little pre-flights and that helps to supplement what Rod has in the chapter. So we'll see you in the video for chapter number two.